Okay. <clears throat> we will be going to the topic diabetes and it is patient centered approach. And we will be uh, uh, dealing with this in <clears throat> this these subtopics like introduction, classification, evaluation, complication, and management. Mm. <laughs> okay, just uh, we are going through the brief description on the uh, definition of diabetes. Uh, actually, it is a metabolic from vascular syndrome. And mainly the process is metabolic, but it will lead to vascular thing. And the main etiology being hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, which will affect the disturbance of carbohydrate, fat, protein, metabolism. And this hyperglycemia may be either due to insulin, decreased insulin secretion, insulin absence, or decreased action of insulin, or both. Okay. And this will lead to both small vessel and large vessel changes that we see as micro and macro angiopathy. Okay. And th this, these are a uh, few things about the ancient things in uh, diabetes. It was first reported in Egypt. And the literature is uh, in uh, 1552 BC, and it was described by Aretus, who first used the term, uh, di uh, this term diabetes. And first report from India came in second and fifth century. It was by Charaga and Shishruda, and they were able to identify diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. And they defined two types of diabetes, lean and obese, and and they found that it is difficult to manage lean diabetes. And few things about history of diabetes. And it was Paul Langerhan who suggested that pancreas contain some secretion that will control <coughs> uh, sugar values. And in 20 years later, a Polish German physician, Oskar Minoski and John von Mering, <coughs> removed the pancreas from a healthy dog to find swarm of flies in the dog's ear. Okay. And in 1901, uh, Eugene Ope is uh, diabetes mellitus suggested that diabetes mellitus is caused by destruction of islet cells. And discovery of insulin, and the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1923 went to discovery, and it was shared between Banting and McLeod. Banting shared it with his uh, his partner Best, and McLeod shared it with his friend colleague. <coughs> A few words on epidemiology of diabetes. Uh, the salient features are that type 2 diabetes compromise majority and in both developed and developing countries, type 2 diabetes is there. And in developed countries, uh, type 2 diabetes is actually a, a disease of middle age group and it is commonly seen in overweight and obese. And <laughs> there is associated, <clears throat> uh, there, there is a worrying trend in uh, type 2 diabetes in children that uh, there in European countries, it is more common in children. Actually, in India, we don't have much data to suggest that it is common in, in, in children or not. The worrying thing is, it is occurring even in non-obese individuals and occasionally seen in children. Uh, there is an uh, article suggesting that they are more prone to develop cardiovascular disease more than uh, what the Europeans have. And the microvascular complications are less. And just for <clears throat> completion, we need to know that there is a national program for prevention and control of cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases and stroke. And this was implemented in 2010 and running successfully to an extent till now. And the strategy is promoting health, healthy lifestyle through massive health education and <clears throat> health education. And this the thing is that that part is not completely true because uh, we know that the health education part in India is not that much good. And, and there is universal screening of adult for five years for this five diseases according under this, uh, this, this, this program. And they are successful to an extent in setting up NCD clinics at CHCs and district levels. And uh, they plan to train uh, more manpower and strengthening of tertiary care facilities for treating these diseases. And the status of diabetes awareness in India, 
it is only 30 43 percentage of individuals have ever heard of diabetes uh, that's why i said that our mass media campaign is not a successful thing of 50 percentage of the diabetic patients they don't know that diabetes will lead to end organ complications and more than 80 percentage don't know that risk factor of diabetes and 50 percentage don't even uh, know that diabetes type 2 diabetes at least type 2 diabetes can be prevented and the diabetes control in India is only 20 to 30 percentage of the patients have their HPA1C under control that is below 7. And it may be partly our mistake and partly the patient's mistake because actually in India we don't follow a guidelines. Whoever treats, they put a guideline and they treat according to their way. But guidelines are there to for, for us to follow. And management of other comorbidities like hypertension and lipids are not not up to par with other countries <clears throat> and uh, more than 50 percent this is a study done by mohan sir and uh, his daughter and it is a multi-centric study and this comprises of at least almost 1.2 lakh of patients all over india this was done in almost seven centers in india and more than 50 percent of patients are not at all informed about the glycemic control i know it is maybe copd in my primary care setting it will be very difficult to explain all these things but it will be good if you suggest uh, these to patients and few words on insulin it is a polypeptide hormone we know that <clears throat> and it has two chains a and b chain and regulation of insulin insulin the initiate of insulin secretion are glucose and certain amino acids and the potentiators are glucagon, other amino acids, acetylcholine, GLP-1 and GLP-IP. And inhibitors of insulin secretion, we know ghrelin, norepinephrine and all. Okay. Uh, this is how insulin is secreted. Just briefing through it. <clears throat> Once When there is a glucose load, glucose enters through the <clears throat> via glute to receptor to beta cells and this leads to activation of glucose by glucose kinase enzyme and this glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate and once this glucose 6-phosphate is converted it is finally break down to ATP and there is an increase in ATP ADP ratio and this will lead to ATP dependent potassium ATP channel closure they leading to membrane <coughs> depolarization this will lead to calcium influx and <coughs> calcium channel and release of insulin stored in the secretory glands okay we will go through a uh, case scenario. This is a 32 year old male, manual labor, who comes here to with, with his sugar values. His fasting plasma glucose is 138 and postprandial glucose is 188 and HPA1C is 7. Okay. Whether it is whether he is diabetic or not. So we have to know what are the criteria. The diagnostic criteria for diabetes is uh, symptoms of hyperglycemia with uh, RBS or any sugar value or plant blood sugar of 200 and more. Okay. <coughs> And fasting plasma glucose more than 126, two hour plasma glucose <coughs> more than 200, and HbA1c more than 6.5. I know the uh, majority of us will be knowing this. And there are few other terminologies which we must be familiar with that is impaired fasting glucose. And it is uh, fasting glucose uh, between 110 and 126, and impaired glucose tolerance where the postprandial is between 140 and 190. And uh, American Diabetic Association suggests that. Uh, this IFG to be 100 and 126, but we usually follow this 110 and 126. Some labs follows the other way. So classification of diabetes, it is broadly classified as type 1, type 2, and other specific of diabetes and GDM. <coughs> and and this is uh, uh, different types of diabetes which we see in youth. Uh, this is very difficult thing to differentiate so that I have Made some case scenarios which will help us identifying this type 1 monogenic type uh, diabetes type 2 diabetes and other form which will be briefly speaking on fcpd and this uh, type 1 is not that much confusing but this monogenic and type 2 which is an early onset type 2 is a bit confusing this is a <clears throat> seven year old boy who presents to your opd with all the classical symptoms of hyperglycemia and he's having abdominal pain, burning maturation. His fasting sugar and postprandial sugar are this, and HP 208 and 342. HP1C is 10.1. Okay. This, this is how he came to you. And from the history, we know that it is having the diabetes. And we what the history we should elicit is whether he was having diabetes previously and whether he is 
<clears throat> on any medicines okay with this history his parents suggest that he is not having diabetes previously so and after five, going through the history of diabetes and uh, its complications we will finally go through an investigation part on examination his height and weight is this and his bmi is 12.5 so his bmi is low and there is no markers of insulin resistance and he is having dehydration all these suggest that he is having type 1 diabetes so we will next go for a ketone bodies in the urine and beta hydroxy butyrate values in blood which is uh, which is suggested that is this elevated lipid profile can be done to see whether the triglycerides are uh, elevated but the c peptide values are uh, uh, the gold standard in this case patient because his fasting and stimulated c peptide is very low so this suggests that he has poor insulin <clears throat> pancreatic reserve beta cell reserve uh, gad antibody in a primary setting i don't know whether we will be able to do it and don't know whether it will be able, the patients will be able to uh, afford it but for completion sake that antibodies can be done and this is the clinical scenario of a type 1 diabetes this is a 15 year old girl who presented our opd with 9 months of duration of diabetes because her age was 15 she was treated as diabetic type 1 diabetic and was initiated on insulin but her sugar values are still high that she is having 196 and ppbs of 320 hp1c is very high here <clears throat> we have to take a family history and go the patient is with us and we have to look for the routine examinations here the main factor is she is having strong family history of diabetes and this uh, suggests that uh, there is a possibility of not being type 1. So in her height and weight, uh, the high weight is 73 and height is 163 and her BMI is 27.5 and HP1C is 9.8. We will go through all the other routine examination and on examination we will see four markers of insulin resistance and she is having acanthosis like this. So the, our investigations will be same as C-peptide because we are suspecting <clears throat> type 2 diabetes in this patient because of this this picture because there is a kind of snake and send on pictures of insulin resistance and her uh, fasting and stimulated c peptides are fairly good so the patient is having good pancreatic beta cell reserve uh, GAD antibody can be done but for research purpose with history and examination it is almost sure that this is having LA type 2 diabetes and the same scenario when a 15 year old boy present your OP with history of recurrent folliculitis so on his back and his fasting sugars are 205 and 321 and his HP1C is 9.5 and uh, her, <clears throat> she was detected to have diabetes at the age of 30 on evaluation for recurrent yeah. OP. But the yeah. history, yeah. The history yeah. that yeah. her mother, yeah. maternal grandmother, maternal aunt and sister all yeah. Yeah. having yeah. Is suggest that it is not type 1, not type 2. So on examination, her height is 157, weight is 52.4, and BMA is fairly okay. And all examination were normal. Once our other profile of investigation are done, the C peptide values will give you that C peptide is normal. It is that is fairly good pancreatic cell reserve. And this is how monogenic diabetes or MODI occurs and the diagnostic criteria is age less than 25 and autosomal dominant transmission that is one side of our family members of three generation will be involved there will be ketosis and this patient will be benefiting with ohs at least in the early period of her disease and uh, this criteria is <clears throat> not uh, relevant now because genetic analysis is recommended now uh, this is another case. This is a 20 year old man who presented with, to you with two years of duration of diabetes. The, the history that he is having recurrent abdominal pain, passing oily stools on and off will suggest that he is having a pancreatic diabetes. So he is having this for past years, but make sure that he is not a smoker and alcohol consumer from the history. 
So he is on OHA, but has been on poor control. Uh, this examination will give you a clue that his weight is low, height, uh, height is 168, his BMI is low, his sugars are very high, and his HbA1c level is almost 10 point. And this investigation, which will help you in diagnosis, is abdominal X-ray or USG. And this is called as fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes. This is commonly found in tropical uh, tropical countries, and it is common in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And this patient should be treated as type one diabetes. And this is a few words on. Uh, uh, late autoimmune diabetes of adults. It's, uh, it's otherwise called as 1.5 diabetes. And the criteria is any, any antibody, autoantibodies associated with the type 1 diabetes and age at onset more than 30 and is will be free from insulin at least for the six months. And C peptide will be low. Okay. Okay, now coming to after we have finished that, uh, we are coming to evaluation of a patient with diabetes. I will be dealing mainly with type 2 diabetes because it is most common and it's on the rise in our country. Not even in our country, in every country it is on the rise. And <clears throat> from the history, we will ask for the classical symptoms of diabetes like frequent urination, excessive thirst and excessive hunger. This frequent urination may present as polyuria or nocturia. And we will have to take a detailed history whether to make sure that the patient understands what we means and what the patient tells we have to make out it is polyuria. And excessive thirst, majority will say that uh, they, their throat is dry at night period. And <clears throat> there will be excessive hunger they, that will be, uh, they will present with the gastritic-like feeling. And there will be weight loss, delayed healing of wound, tiredness, itching, in the genital area due to fungal infection and tingling and numbness and visual disturbances. Uh, of the 60 percentage of the patients who do not have any other symptoms, they will be detected to have diabetes when we look for any other diseases. <clears throat> we will have to take a detailed family history to differentiate whether it is maturity onset or late early onset diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes and medical history uh, with the previous, uh, previous, previous, previous treatments outcome and present treatment, drug allergy in products, history of hospitalization, hypoglycemia, and other <clears throat> any other complication associated with it. And ask for symptoms suggestive of complications such as facial puffiness, fetal edema, nocturia, frothing of urine, uh, <clears throat> angina, foot intolerance, claudication, sensory impairment, and sexual dysfunction also. Physical examination. The physical examination, as usual, we will do height, weight, BMI, weight, stick, circumference, uh, blood pressure measurement. Look for postural variation and <clears throat> and ab abdominal examination, thyroid examination for any other other endocrine diseases, and skin examination to look for features of hyperinsulin insulin sorry insulin resistance. Fundus examination should be done for each and every patient, don't miss dental or oral examination because it may be a source of infection in diabetic patient. And comprehensive foot care. It should start from the day one of diabetes with inspection, palpation, ABP, angle brachial index, angle and major, proprioception, vibration, and monofilic sensation. The investigation panels <clears throat> for the first visit once in three months, once in six months, and annually. This is usually followed guideline, but it has to be individualized because most of our patients may not be affording each and every investigation because this investigation panel will be costly for uh, these patients. Since in primary care, it will be difficult to do all these things. <clears throat> in the first visit, it is usually <clears throat> asked to do HbA1c, plasma glucose levels, lipids profile, liver function test, uh, renal function test, urine albumin creatine ratio, hemogram, ECG, chest x-ray and echocardiogram and thyroid TSH values if it is indicated and if the history suggests it is there and retinal examination, foot exam and oral examination. Once in three months, HbA1c and plasma glucose should be repeated and once in six months, HbA1c, plasma glucose and serum lipids. Annually, all these tests should be then repeated. And um, I don't think a majority of our patients will be affording this. 
Now coming to complications of diabetes. Uh, diabetes complication can be divided into acute and chronic. Acute can be metabolic and infection, and chronic can be vascular. Of this acute, uh, decay, HHS, uh, hypoglycemia, lactal acidosis, are there, and infection. So we will go through this one by one. So infection and diabetes, it is not merely the hyperinsulinemia that is causing diabetes, uh, this infection, partly patient's part and partly uh, uh, their immune response. This common infections which we see is urinary tract infection, which may present as either cystitis, pyelonephritis, or renal abscess. Whenever a patient, your diabetic patients come to you with fatigue and uh, fatigue, always think of UTI in a diabetic patient. And respiratory infection, um, this common bacteria or common commensal bacteria may get uh, notorious when we have uh, uncontrolled diabetes or when we have a pure immune response. Uh, uh, that can be a staph for yes, pneumonia, gram negative pneumonia, lung abscess, tuberculosis. Uh, it has been seen that tuberculosis is much more prevalent in uh, diabetic patients because of their decreased immune response. Uh, so always think of tuberculosis when a patient present with uh, prolonged fever and uh, it, uh, with, uh, present with PO in a diabetic patient. Skin and soft tissue infections are common in diabetic patients. Uh, it may be either folliculitis, carbuncle, pharyngeal, anything may be the surgical wound infection and foot infections are also common. Abdominal infections are common. Whenever we have a patient with recurrent sty and callosion, always think of refractive error and uncontrolled diabetes. Oral infections should always be, uh, always be looked for because periodontitis are common in diabetic patients. Now we'll go through a case scenario. This is a 12 year old boy who's brought with complaints of vomiting, abdominal pain, and breathing difficulty. And his parents states that he has been complaining of excessive urination and taste during the uh, last few weeks. <clears throat> uh, on examination, the patient is drowsy and he's having acidotic breathing. And his BAP is 100 bar 60 and pulse rate. There is tachycardia, there is tachypnea, his scapulary blood glucose is very high. It is 520. So uh, with, from these symptoms, it is suggestive that he is having diabetic ketoacidosis. So we'll go through details of the diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis <clears throat> it is a state of metabolic decompensation, which occurs due to insulin deficiency. And the three components are hyperglycemia, ketosis, and metabolic acidosis. The classical symptoms will be either due to hyperglycemia or neurological symptoms or gastrointestinal symptoms. The gastrointestinal symptoms, the patient may present as acute abdomen. Always think that nausea vomiting and acute abdomen in a lean patient with these features, with sugar values high, think of diabetic ketoacidosis. And the symptoms, uh, you know, it may develop within hours or days. Okay, respiratory symptoms also common in these patients. They will have a rapid deep breathing that is cosmal respiration. Features of dehydration will be there and changes of mentation and other features of hypothermia, hyperapnea will be there. Smell of acetone in breath is not usually seen, but may be seen in some patients. This is a formula to get the corrected serum sodium levels. Uh, we can use this formula for fluid correction and sodium correction in diabetic ketoacidosis. The mainstay of treatment is intravascular fluid correction electrolyte correction, acid-base balance, and initiation of insulin to treat the metabolic catabolism. And we have to monitor the patient, treat the precipitate underlying cause, and prevent complication, and provide education follow-up of this patient. Okay. Uh, there are uh, diabetic ketosis may be mild or moderate and severe. In mild, we can treat them in an observation basis and we can give them added salt fluid. Insulin may be initiated at S 0.25 to 0.5 units per kilogram and may be repeated every two to four hours. Monitoring blood glucose should be done every two to four hours and they can be kept in hospital for six to 12 hours. Once they are okay, they can be left. But moderate and severe ketoacidosis cannot be treated in a OP basis. It should be treated in an IP setting, uh, preferably in an uh, ICU setting. And uh, the things to be looked for are same, but the frequency should be more and 
continue insulin till the patient is able to eat and the insulin uh, infusion can be continued uh, for 30 to 60 meters after which subcutaneous insulin can be given always look for a precipitating factor okay uh, this is a algorithm which will help us in uh, treating this with a fluid <clears throat> the fluid management in type uh, this diabetic ketoacidosis is a uh, little challenging always don't go with overhydration because the look at the status kidney status heart status of the patient whether he is having uh, lvf4 or not or he having ckd always think of hypo when look at this chart we will go through the chart when the patient is having hypovolemic shock we will start on uh, administering 0.9 of sodium chloride one liter per hour and or other plasma expanders if the if the patient is in mild hypotension or cardiogenic shock we will evaluate the corrected we will look for the corrected uh, sorry for the scribbling uh, corrected serum sodium levels and serum if the serum sodium level is high or normal then we will administer 0.45 percentage of sodium chloride uh, and the rate at which to, it to be done is 7 to 14 7 to 14 milliliter kilogram per kilogram per hour and once the sugar uh, and if the uh, sugar values is below 250, we can administer a dextro, 5% dextrose along with 0.45 saline and the insulin should be at a rate of 0.05 to 0.1 infusion. And, and the, our aim should be to keep the blood sugar value between 150 and 200 and it should be checked every two to four hours. Okay, And once the patient is okay we can convert it to subcutaneous regimen and insulin can be either given in iv route or subcutaneous route for iv insulin uh, we can give 0.15 unit per kg as iv bolus and uh, regular insulin is usually preferred that is our plain insulin 0.1 unit per kg is intuition if blood glucose level uh, does not fall by 50 to 70 milligram we have to repeat this uh, until the glucose values are below 250. Uh, for subcutaneous route, the insulin values will be a bit higher and potassium correction is, uh, sorry, potassium correction is a little challenging in these patients because we have to continuously monitor the potassium level. When insulin is initiated, potassium will go down. So, if it is less than 3.3 milliequivalents, then hold insulin for some time and keep 40 milliequivalent of potassium per, per hour and uh, look for the values. And if the serum potassium level goes beyond 5.5 milliequivalent, uh, don't give extra uh, potassium check for two hour, every two hour. Our main aim is to keep it between 3.3 to 5.5. And once it is okay, we can continue with 20 to 30 milliequivalents of potassium. Okay. That is a brief discussion on uh, that uh, diabetic ketosis. This is a 82 year old lady who's staying alone and is, is on OHA. And she has admitted to your hospital with history of confusion, fits, and her glucose values are very high, 780. And uh, blood analysis shows there is absence of ketonuria and her pH is 37.3. So, uh, and her sodium levels are very high. This suggests that she is having dehydration and severe dehydration. So HHH hyperosponar hyperglycemic state, previously known as HONK, is most commonly in elderly who are uh, who is type 2 diabetic and who are neglected or living alone or who is not receiving fluids in hospital. For everything, the precipitating factors should be initially found out. Our main objective should be to find out the infect, uh, precipitating factor. It may be either infection, stress, hypovolemia, or, or failure, or inadequate fluid intake, or inadequate accessibility, or incapacitation. The <clears throat> four primary things that we see in HHS is that is severe hypoglycemia, absence of ketosis, profound dehydration, and neurological manifestation. More than that, we will see in type one uh, the diabetic ketosis. So they will be having lesser GI symptoms. Uh, that respiratory, incusimal respiration is seldom observed. The you know, focal neurological deficit will be more in these patients. 
and the laboratory findings will suggest that there will be very high glucose ketone release will be usually negative elevated osmolarity and the treatment aim is uh, insulin management treat the complication hydration okay this is another case of uh, 45 year old 44 year old male who's a type 2 diabetics for last eight years and he's on glibanglamide uh, twice daily and metformin one gram daily and his fasting sugar is 96 and his postprandial sugar is 126 uh, his complaints of headache inability to concentrate and nervousness at around 4 pm every day these symptoms disappears after taking a toffee something sweet so it is a case of hypoglycemia we will try out suggest that symptoms of hypoglycemia recovery with carbohydrate and documented low blood glucose level uh, actually the hypoglycemia can be classified into step one step two step three step one in hypoglycemia suggests that uh, the patient is having uh, glucose level of less than 70 but he is conscious oriented step two it is less than 54 he is conscious oriented and step three patient is unconscious uh, and for the conscious patient, we can the rule of 15 is usually followed. We can give 15 gram of glucose uh, and recheck after 15 minutes. If it is less than 50, we will repeat it for three times and recheck after 15 to 20 minutes, and we will see whether it is getting better. If the patient is unconscious, intravenous route is usually taken. Uh, either 50 ml, 50 percent dextrose, or 25 ml, 100 uh, 20, 100 ml, 25 percent dextrose will be given rapidly and check GRPS or after seven after 15 minutes, and we will see if it is less than 70. Uh, if it is less than 70, repeat this thing until the uh, blood sugar levels are 70, and maintenance of with uh, 5 percent dextrose or 10 percent dextrose may be done with oral feeds. If there is no intravenous acts, administer one milligram of glucagon subcutaneously. Recent studies say that three, three mil, up to three milligram of glucagon can be given. And our main part is prevention. Being a primary care physician, our main part is prevention. Always explain hypoglycemic symptoms to your patient because uh, whenever they take sulfonylurea or insulin, secretogogs or insulin, they are at risk for hypoglycemia. So they should be advised regularity of diet, insulin, and exercise. And between meals, snacks, and bedtime snacks can be advocated if they are facing this problem. They should be asked to keep a regular follow-up of their blood sugar values and keep all these things, that sugary things with them. And education is very important. And analog insulin can be used in patients who are taking plain insulin or other insulin because this tends to be less uh, hypoglycemic. Now we will be going through the microvascular complications of diabetes. <clears throat> the basic pathology for all the microvascular complications remains the same. That is, there is progressive narrowing and occlusion of vascular lumina. There will be impaired perfusion, ischemia, and tissue damage. And <clears throat> the microvascular complication, the cells affected in retina are endothelial cells, pericytes, mullar cells, and ganglion cells. And Renal cells, it is mesangial cells and porocytes. And peripheral nerves, schwann cells, endothelial cells, and pericytes are involved. This is a, <clears throat> there are two case scenarios which we will discuss. This is a 16 year, 69 year old male who is type 2 diabetic for 16 years on glimmy and metformin. And he presented to you with polyuria and his, his BP is 160, 100, and weight is 70, height is 164, and his sugar values are 210. And this HPA1C is 11% and protein UAS 1.1 gram. And his retinal examination gives NPDR. So, this is a case of diabetic kidney disease. So, and this is another case of a uh, patient coming with protein urea. But here, the duration of diabetes is less and there is no retinal changes. So, this will suggest that it is not diabetic kidney disease, it may be any other disease. So, when it is suspected, uh, non-diabetic kidney disease in a patient with diabetes. So it is when it is short duration of less than five years, absent of absence of retinopathy, and when the, whether there is grossly elevated lipids and there is active sediments in the urine, and there is history of clinical features of primary renal disease, primary renal disease. So we can have two for one formula for MDRD formula 
for EGFR calculation, but it is not at all required nowadays because we have our fonts which will give. If you put the creating value, they will give the values. But chronically, uh, so uh, we can go through it, uh, note it because it may be sometimes helpful. And we have, there is a definition for chronic disease uh, when the EGFR value is less than sixty ml per milliliter per 1.73 meter square for more than three months it is defined as CKD. So diabetic kidney disease, it is either albuminuria or reduced EGFR with history of long duration of diabetes without primary. Uh, we have to be, <clears throat> we have to know the risk factors for diabetic kidney disease because being a primary care physician, our main aim is to prevent nephropathy. So know the uh, we have to control hypertension, control hyperglycemia, uh, control hemicroalbuminuria. Uh, duration of uh, diabetes is one factor which will uh, aggravate, uh, which will make the patient more prone to uh, diabetic kidney disease. Family history of similar illness in family, ethnicity and cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is an uh, important factor adding on to this and hyperlipidemia. Our treatment aim is to control the glycemic value as much as possible for that the complication doesn't develop. RAS blockade to prevent further progression of kidney disease, lipid control, blood pressure control, diet control. Diet control has been proven benefit in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Always reinforce uh, this uh, dietary habits in patients. So a few words on uh, which all drugs to be uh, Caution with in diabetes patient with CKD. Metformin is contraindicated if the EGFR value is less than 30 and reduced to if the EGFR is between 30 to 45. Sulfonyl urea is to be avoided, but if at all using short acting, nice uh, things like glyphosate and glyphosate may be used. Uh, Ripaglinide is safe in kidney disease. Glyphosate and carbos should be avoided. SGL2 and GPL1 receptor agonists are beneficial in preventing progression of the disease. If we are using sitagliptin, saxagliptin, and vildagliptin, these dose should be adjusted. Dinagliptin and tenagliptin can be used without dose adjustment. And insulin is safe for any EGFR. Be cautious using the insulin. Start in minimal dose and uh, increase the dose accordingly. And microalbumin testing should be done in type 2 diabetic patient at the time of uh, first when you detect diabetes, and it should be followed up every yearly. And microalbuminuria in type 1 diabetic patient can be done every uh, started fifth year of uh, identification of diabetes, and it should be continued every year. Right? And, and always look for microalbuminuria because it's early stages of diabetic glomerulopathy. And at this stage, it is reversible. And the blood pressure should be kept below 14090. But if the patient is having other risk factors like uh, uh, CVDs or other risk factors, it should be kept below 130, 80. And the best drug for that is AC inverters and ARPs. And recently, studies say that uh, mineral corticoid fentanyl has been shown to reduce progression of diabetic kidney disease and proteinuria in type 2 patients. Dietary modification, there should be a protein restriction so that the filtration, hyperfiltration and intraglomerular pressure is reduced. And the uh, protein restriction should be 0.8 gram per kilogram per day, 0.6 to 0.8, and uh, sodium restriction less than 2.3 gram per day. And always avoid nephrotoxic drugs, prevent dehydration, avoid smoking, early and aggressive treatment of UTI in a patient with diabetes, which will worsen their renal status and uh, restriction of sodium phosphate when it is indicated, always control other things like uh, lipids and hypertension. And when to refer, if there is a rapid rise in creatine or hyperkalemia and a rapid fall in EGFR, then definitely the patient should be referred to a nephrologist. And few words on diabetic retinopathy. Uh, these are microangiopathy due to prolonged uncontrolled hyperglycemia. Uh, these patients present very late to us because uh, it is usually not looked for and their symptom, they may be asymptomatic. When their macular region is affected, they will have some problem of diminishing vision 
otherwise they will present with bloaters floaters etc and <clears throat> the classification is npdr and pdr it can be npdr can be early mild moderate and uh, severe diabetic retinopathy and th there are certain factors influencing the course of diabetic retinopathy duration hyper uh, glycemic control hypertension serum lipid values renal disease pregnancy and all these contribute to uh, aggravates this uh, the retinopathy so retinal examination in type 1 diabetes should be done within 5 years as we said for that renal thing also 5 years after diagnosis and every year 1 to 2 years thereafter and type 2 diabetes retinal examination should be done at the time of diagnosis and should be followed up every year and always take an opinion from an ophthalmologist if they detect any other lesions and there are certain other non retinal ocular manifestation cataract and anterior ischemic retinopathy, diabetic papillopathy, ocular motor movement disorders, and all this should be, uh, you should be aware of the things that this, this are, these are all things are also there. And uh, and there are certain conditions for which diabetes is respected, like glaucoma, ischemic, retinal artery occlusion, retinal embolism, retinal vein occlusion, coronary, corneal disease, etc. So coming to the next um, complication it is uh, it is the most common and the first thing to occur that is diabetic neuropathy it is most troublesome for all diabetes and it is a painful complication more than 50 percentage will of diabetic patients will have diabetic this peripheral neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy and uh, the thing is it is painful and and erectile dysfunction which is a part of it is a hidden complications the definition suggests that the presence of symptoms or signs of peripheral nerve dysfunction in the patient with the diabetes with, uh, with after exclusion of other diseases. Always know that diabetic neuropathy is not a single entity. It may be, uh, as well, there may be aggravating or associated features of nutritional deficiency <coughs> along with diabetic neuropathy. So the classification is diffuse neuropathy, mononeuropathy, uh, radiculopathy and non-diabetic non neuropathy. So of this diffuse symmetrical polyneuropathy is common one. And that is what we usually see. And this mononeuropathy may present as cranial nerve palsies like third nerve or third nerve and sixth nerve palsies. <coughs> okay. The diffuse symmetrical polyneuropathy is the most common presentation. And it is, it is a chronic sensory motor, but initially it is the sensory which uh, presents as cloven and stalking. Later on, it will affect the motor part also. And few words on uh, clinical manifestation autonomic, autonomic neuropathy. Maybe cardiovascular or GI. Cardiovascular, the patient may present with a tachycardia, cardiac denervation, and orthostatic hypotension, skin temperature reversal, dry skin and dependent edema. And GI, it, is, it uh, may present as gastroparesis, constipation, diarrhea, or fecal. The management is good glycemic control, symptomatic treatment of the pain, and agents that can help in restoring the nerve function and avoidance of nerve toxins. Coming to the macrovascular diseases in diabetes, macrovascular diseases affects large arteries, commonly coronary arteries, peripheral artery disease, and stroke. All these have two to four times risk, high risk factor when compared to general population. Uh, it is multifactorial. We have to know control hypertension, control obesity, psychological stress factors should be controlled, alcohol consumption should be stopped, smoking cessation should be there, cholesterol level should be controlled, uh, increased consumption of fruits and vegetables should be <coughs> advocated, decrease in alcohol should be advised, control of diabetes, good physical activity should be there to <coughs> prevent this. There is a ticking clock hypothesis suggests that microvascular complication starts once uh, the, the once the onset of hyperglycemia. But for macrovascular diseases, the clock ticking <coughs> even pre at the pre-diabetic stage. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Coronary artery disease may present as stable in China, unstable in China, uh, variant in China. Anything it may uh, present as acute myocardial infection, frangamide. Uh, but the peculiar, there are certain peculiarities in 
a diabetic patient that it may be silent or it may present as a typical angina equivalence at younger age it may involve all blood vessels or small vessels or the complications are more common and outcome is very bad with revascular procedures uh, <clears throat> there are strategies for uh, cad practice our aim being a primary care physician should be to early diagnosis of diabetes good control of diabetes control of their lipids control of their bp aspirin whenever indicated dietary modification exercise weight reduction should be emphasized each and every time you see a patient and addiction should be avoided relaxation techniques should be advised each and every time the diet weight reduction dietary modification should be should be emphasized to each and every patient even though even without knowing their diabetic status because it will help in preventing all this all these diseases metabolic diseases so our major goal of treatment is to increase the coronary artery perfusion decrease the myocardial workload prevent myocardial infection disability or death and intervene intervene in case of unstable angina now we will see two case scenarios this is a 58 year old male who has been diabetic for past 24 years and he is a chronic smoker and he smokes about 20 cigarettes per day and he complains of severe pain in the right leg when which, which develops when he walks for 15 minutes and pain subsides on taking this this pad pad we you know it is a peripheral artery disease making this posture and dorsalis pedis pulse are not <clears throat> not palpable this is another patient who is diabetic for the past 12 years he said he had a trauma to his leg and it uh, and it, there is a wound with infection and it is a uh, ulcerated wound which has intruded the bone so and his examination revealed that the monofilament test is positive or vibration sensation at 128 hertz is absent his angle jerk is absent so these are two conditions peripheral artery disease and diabetic foot which goes together so pad <coughs> uh, the common contributing factors are smoking dyslipidemia uncontrolled of uncontrolled hypertension obesity which is mainly triangle associated renal diseases and high lipid levels the signs which we should always signs and symptoms being a primary care physician we should always know that intermittent claudication nocturnal pain non healing ulcers absent pulse or cold feet gangrene loss of hair or low, hair on the legs shiny atrophic skin and thick toenails all these should be noted and should be identified at the earliest so that we can prevent this and uh, they point to note that claudication in rest pain may not be prominent in patient with neuropathy diagnosis is with angle brachial index which we can do at our opd and color doppler angiogram mr angiogram ct angiogram or dsa anything can be the management is relieving of the pain with uh, uh, vasodilators and uh, other drugs to reduce the pain and if there is a clot thrombolytic agents can be used if there is obstruction angioplasty can be done if no other option bypass surgery can be done. now coming to the principles of diabetic foot management always look for look for the stages of ulcer if there is this present and prevent development of risk factors good glycemic control lipid control and good foot care practices high risk foot uh, proper foot wear uh, cones and calluses should be uh, removed early under supervision metabolic control of diabetes and other uh, other parameters patient education and good food care practices there are staging six stages uh, one is normal food no risk factor other one is high risk food risk food with no ulceration but past history of ulceration may be there and ulcerated food with screen breakdown which may present as ulcers blisters or fissure uh, up to here we can manage both this uh, it is better to refer to a foot clinic if you are confident in doing uh, this <clears throat> procedure you can do it and this infected foot uh, 4 and 5 necrotic and 6 and salvageable foot above 5 and 6 definitely it should be sent to a foot clinic <clears throat> now we coming to the cerebrovascular diseases diabetic patient may present as any of this 
it may be either classical stroke, complete stroke, major or minor, or TAA. And the risk factors which should be prevented to help in prevention of the CV. Always, always be <clears throat> know that the risk factors which we can modify will be helping the patient. And hypertension control, smoking cessation, diabetes control, dyslipidemia control, polycythemia control, decreased alcohol intake, oral contraceptive use in patients with diabetes are contraindicated. And the diagnosis may be done with the, uh, clinical evaluation in the first and imaging techniques in the lake. Now coming to the management of diabetes, which itself is a big challenge. Diet, exercise should be the primary part and education. Drugs only comes after that. The uh, ADA and RSSDA guidelines suggest fasting sugar to be 80 to 130 and uh, RSS, uh, ADA suggests 115 and RSSDA 80 to 130 and the postprandial sugar to be 180 and 160. HP1C is common for both. Uh, what, our, what, will, what should be our aim? <clears throat> our aim should be to correct the metabolic problem associated with hyperglycemia and ensure normoglycemia as much as possible and identification and treatment of comorbidities at the earliest. And patients should be educated each and every time when you get an opportunity. And treatment of diabetes is always glucocentric, but it should not be like that. At least our, our we the family physician should be multi <coughs> multi centric because it is not their uh, sugar values that we are treating. We should treat each and every thing that the nutritional part, weight management, addiction prevention, everything, hypertension, everything should be looked into. And we will see a case scenario. This is a thirty five year old male who has impaired glucose tolerance and and he did his OGTT few months back and is worried that he is going to get diabetes. His BMI is 37.5. What advice being a family physician will you give? So our in <clears throat> intervention starts at his diet and the steps in dietary invention is assessment of his calories, which we can do with a 24-hour recall method. Uh, of, a, of one, one in a holiday and, and two other working days and determination of his other weight, height, weight and anthropometries, calculate calories, make a meal plan for him and follow. It never force a patient to take a meal which we like, always make a meal plan which the patient can adjust and which is available for him. Usually dietitians do what they like and what they ask them to eat and the components of dietary management in diabetes is to go do a good glycemic control lipid control and weight maintenance the thing is to restrict calories uh, quantity and quality of carbohydrate modify fat intake which i will be dealing detail the carbohydrate should be 50 to 60 percentage of total calorie and it should be complex carbohydrate and refined should be sugars should be avoided. Low glycemic should could, should be taken, and there should be fiber which each carbohydrate may. And protein, as usual, one to one gram to one gram per kilogram, and it should contribute to fifteen to twenty percentage of diet. And uh, non-vegetarian, vegetarian, the patient can choose because it is his diet. He can choose it, and dietary fats and. Diabetes dietary fat should be restricted to 30% and saturated fat should be restricted to less than 10%. And trans fat should be best avoided and monounsaturated fatty acid is to be encouraged. This is a uh, food chart which I used to prescribe to my patient, which is a diet. The right, the, the one in the, this one is our PK search diet and this is a Harvard, a Harvard Medical School's diet. They found out after a long, long research. And this is the uh, diet which I have been hearing from him since 2007. So both are same. <clears throat> and I always prescribe a diet chart for my patient with uh, what all things they can eat in a diabetic patient. So uh, try to maintain a diet free chart for a patient which he can, which he can afford. So exercise in type 2 diabetes, 
Miss Rajan is a 60 year, 60 year old male and he has diabetes for the past 25 years and is hypertensive and hypercholesterolemia, has uh, dyslipidemia and he <clears throat> needs a sedentary life. He heard from his friends about the benefit of exercise and you are his family physician. What advice, advice will you give her, to him regarding the exercise? So always make sure that the patient knows what exercise is. Uh, they will be saying that I am doing this work and that work which contribute to which they attribute to their exercise. But always exercise is a physical activity that is well planned, structured, repetitive and purposeful and usually aimed at improving or maintaining physical fitness. And physical activity is another different thing. It is any body movement produced by skeletal muscle that result in energy expenditure beyond resting expenditure. So it has a benefit that exercise has a benefit. Reduction of weight improves bone joint muscle health, improves circulation, promotes social interaction and interaction, reduce stress, improves functional capacity. So uh, this is a uh, 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 wording from Suresh Sir's talk that fit, fit, answer the patient with fit. Fit means frequency, intensity, type and time. The, the frequency at least five to five weeks per day. Intensity should be moderate and the type of exercise should be aerobic and resistant training. And time should be 30 to 45 minutes. That is 150 minutes per week. And aerobic exercise four to seven days per week, at least five days should be there. And it should be 20 to 60 minutes of continuous exercise, if not possible, accumulated in bouts of at least 10 minutes. And resistance exercise, it should be uh, a 70 to 80 percentage of our heart rate and maximum frequency of two to three days with a 24 48 hour gap in between and the intensity can be done in two to three sets always limit the patient to their extent the way uh, because many will be having ischemic heart disease ckd or any other complication so they their their personal uh, 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 things should be taken care of so not personal things personal opinion should be taken patient education in diabetes this is the most important part which we should emphasize every patient encounter we should be uh, treated as an educational opportunity uh, and the components includes education regarding the disease we should educating regarding the disease in each and every visit because uh, once you talk to a patient 100 times, they will follow for a single time. So monitor the diabetes, give them advice regarding when to monitor, when to uh, come back to you with their results and information regarding the treatment options and what the, what the current treatment is, what all things can be added, what can be withdrawn when the diabetic status is controlled or worse. And information regarding complications should be advised and ask them to meet you when they see any of the warning signs advocated to them and always tell them about special situation like fever, any other uh, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, uh, foot injury, anything or UTI, any infection, ask them to come back to you. And self-monitoring blood glucose should be <coughs> advocated. <coughs> now coming to the anti-diabetic drugs which are available in India. Uh, these are the classes of drugs which are available for treatment and available in India. Vigoanides, insulin secretagogues like sulfonylureas, meglitinides, thiazolines, and alpha glucose base inhibitors, DPP4 inhibitors, and injectable things, SGLT inhibitors, GLP1 receptor agonist, injectable and oral, and other agents. Uh, we, and insulins, we will be knowing all of these, all of us will be knowing this. These are the uh, classes of and their side effects and mechanisms of action, which hopefully everyone will be knowing. <coughs> the primary agent for treatment of a type 2 diabetes is type 2 diabetic patient is metformin. And we can add <coughs> according to their risk factors. So the first line being the, uh, the metformin, the priority uh, depends on each patient. If the patient's priority is avoidance of hypoglycemia, we can add any of this second line drug. Second line drug may be DPP4 inhibitor, GP1 receptor, GLP1 receptor analog, SGLT or thiazolines. And <clears throat> we can add any of this. If another third line is to be added, metformin, one of this agent and any other from this agent. And always don't combine 
DPP4 with GLP1 anode. If there is a fourth duct to be added, always uh, pick from the uh, uh, thiazolines or other drugs. But if we have to use more than four drugs, better to initiate insulin. And if the <coughs> priority is avoidance of weight gain, we have to start on either GLP1 agonist or SGL2 inhibitor. And the combination, if the third drug has to be initiated, we can use these two together. Never use, uh, again, once again, I'm emphasizing DPP4 and GLP1. And when the fourth drug is to be added, always the sulfonylurea thiazolines are to be advocated, but they will produce weight gain. If in our scenario, the cause concern is of prime importance. So the second agent is always sulfonylurea or thiazolines because these are least expensive and combination of uh, the second line agents can be added. Uh, it is better if for these patients, if the cost is concerned, we can start our amount in pH, which will be available <coughs> in PHCs and CHs. If they have other uh, risk factors, then cardiovascular risk factor or any other risk factor, better to start uh, uh, to have metformin. Along with that, we can have CLP or SGLT uh, to inhibit us because these drugs have beneficial effect. If the third drug is to be added, we have to do it, have a combination of all these three drugs. And if another one is to be added, basal insulin or sulfonylurea, thiose volumes. If there is heart failure, SGLT2 is the best drug to be started, second line drug. And other agents can be added, but always be cautious using thiazolines, axagliptin, and alloglyptin. If there is diabetic kidney disease, SGLT2 is the best drug to, uh, to be added on metformin and GLP, if not tolerated, GLP-1 receptor uh, uh, analog can be used, agonist can be used. And if third drug, we can use combination. And before the adding on to fourth drug, always check for EGFR. If the patient is having a CKD without albuminuria, again, SGLP and GLP-1 analogs are better. And third drug, these two can be combined. So always uh, think of these drugs because the dose and all thing, I know everybody will be knowing. So always think, go through this slide or go through these things when we start prescribing OHS to a patient. And few words on insulin. We have human insulin, which can be regular or NPH, which we usually use. And we know that one is clear and other is non-clear. And premixed insulin, which benefits the patient <clears throat> feel convenient because of the uh, uh, only two time pricking uh, available needed. And there are ultra rapid acting, rapid acting analogs. These have better benefit because they will have better postprandial glycemic control, fewer episodes of hypoglycemia, flexibility in lifestyle, safer in elderly, and mm, long acting analogs like large in detrimer and all. Uh, this can be used because the hypoglycemic chances are very less. And we know that they are peakless and they are hypoglycemic. <clears throat> These are insulin preparation, which we have discussed, and the duration of action, uh, half life, and uh, onset of action. The human regular insulin, it takes 30 to 6 minutes to act, and peak is 2 to 3 hours, and for act for 4 to 6 hours. As part, 5 to 15 minutes, 1 to 2 hours, and 3 to 6 hours. Fluslin, 5 to 20, 1 to 2 hours, and 2 to 4 hours. Lispro, uh, 5 to 15 minutes, 30 to 75 minutes, and 2 to And the other things we know that the large and detriment the glucotec are peak plus, and the glucotec has an advantage of more than 72 hour action. Say so insulin initiation, when to start an insulin, when there, when there is OHA failure, when the patient is not compliant, we can start on insulin. And in the newly diagnosed patients who are symptomatic, uh, the insulin starting guidelines are when the HP1C is more than 9. Fasting sugar is more than 250 and postprandial is more than 300. And when there is ketonuria, catabolic state, and pregnancy. Okay. And the regimens which we can we have is basal insulin, premixed insulin, basal plus, and bolus regime. So basal insulin regime, when, when the OHA is more than three or four, we can have a basal insulin in the night along with this OHA. And but the chance for hypoglycemia is very high. Uh, we can initiate it at, at 10 to 12 units or 0.2 units per kg, preferably <clears throat> uh, in the night or morning. 
uh, whichever we with the patient feel comfortable but uh, there will be uh, and the dose titration has to be done in 2 to 3 days but the compliance will be less but there is a advantage that the patient may not have much weight gain and pre mix insulin patients are patients will be liking this because they have better advantage because better control of postprandial and they are more acceptable because of their uh, uh, two time pricking only and disadvantage is that hypoglycemia and la- less flexibility so we can have this start on 10 units or 0.2 units per uh, kg uh, in the morning half hour before prior to uh, dinner or uh, breakfast and in the night before dinner and we can adjust the dose according to these values if the blood glucose is less than 100 we can reduce the dose for minus risk to reduce the dose by two units if it is 100 to 1 should no need to change if it is 100 to 140 we can change to plus uh, two units and if it is 140 to 80 we can hike the dose to four units by four unit and if it is more than 180 hike the unit by six unit and if the human insulin is the more demand uh, the dosage is more than 20 unit we can split it to two third and one third if we are using 50 50 combination then we can uh, split it when the unit is 30 units above so at last <clears throat> when all the uh, things are uh, exhausted we will ultimately come back to their basal bolus regime uh, either a nph at bed time and regular insulin three times or a basal or long acting at uh, bed time and a rapid acting with each meal and this can be given at 0.8 to 1 unit per kg half the dose can be given as uh, nph or basal and uh, half the dose can be divided in regular or rapid acting and when there is hyperglycemia we can increase the unit by 2 unit in the morning uh, and two unit by in the night and if the hypoglycemia of this hypoglycemia we can reduce it by 2 unit in the night and 2 unit in the evening so uh, this is uh, the hp1c level of all the uh, things which we have discussed diet and exercise uh, there will be a 0.5 to 2 uh, percentage reduction in hp1c and if a sulfonylurea it is will be 1 to 2 percent metformin 1 to 2 and uh, thiazolines 0.5 to 1 glucose it alpha alpha glucose index 0.5 to 8 dpp for input is 0.5 to 1 and sclt 0.5 to 1 and ingredients it uh, is will be around an insulin 5 percentage or unlimited and don't be in a hurry to change your ohs or in uh, drugs because it will take time and uh, uh, anticipated response time is secretor gox long acting it will take 7 to 10 days and rapid acting it will take immediate action and if it is meant for me it will take 2 to 3 weeks and the more the fasting sugar will be a indicator for its control glitters on 6 to 8 weeks both fasting and ppbs and dpp4 and sclt uh, they will take 7 days and immediate and thank you for the patient listening it was a vast topic and hopefully it was beneficial helpful to all of you <coughs> thank you dr deepak for the such an extensive presentation and uh, <clears throat> you have to thank anushri for giving sharing her laptop with you now you understand right behind every successful man there is a woman is it right yes madam <laughs> <laughs> okay <clears throat> i think uh, uh, is there any time for discussion <clears throat> this one question i ask then uh, can you generalize taking hb1c for all the diabetic patients is there anything you need to take care of because hb1c hb1c you know is a very costly test right yes madam we yeah. have to individualize affordability yeah. is a big problem yeah in our phcs and chcs and medical wow. college majority will be coming uh, for medicines only and they won't okay. be interested in doing hb1c but okay. uh, for those uh, and patients who are affording we can do but better to do urine acr than hb1c because it and will hb1c i think uh, it gives false values in certain diseases right? yes 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 madam yeah yeah hemoglobin there will be but the thing is uh, in medical college they are their government is providing subsidies and they will be doing it when they have the kit available 
Okay. So the patient will have to uh, have a low amount, I think 80 or 100 rupees for HPA1C. Okay, okay. There is a diabetic clinic which <laughs> helps them. Okay, so uh, you told about the some government program, no? national program yes, for yes, control. Yes. So are there any guidelines for that at what age you should start checking or anything, any protocols given? Have Madam, no in idea? that guideline, they say that everyone should be started, uh, should start screening if he's obese and if he's having any of the risk factor, but we do a general examination, if we see any of the features of insulin resistance and if the age is less than uh, about 30, we have to screen. Okay. Uh, risk factors also? High risk yes. factors? Yes, high risk factors. Family it's, history also. We have discussed right? if anything Strong is there, history. we have to screen the patient. Okay. But there is a program running now in, in Kerala by uh, Kerala government. They are screening each and every patient with less than 30 and uh, there is a news report in uh, today's paper that uh, uh, there are about one like that 30 to 50 percentage are having either hypertension or having pre-diabetic state yeah and recently i had a uh, question from our uh, our law uh, our uh, name is about regarding uh, data of uh, the diabetic status control program and its benefits okay. which actually i don't know which I had to go through the uh, majority of the programs which the Kerala government is running. And it, it is, it is it, they, they found that around 40 to 50 percentage of young people are having either uh, risk factor for hypertension, diabetes, or, and 30 percentage are having either pre, are either pre diabetic, and 20 percentage of young adults are having diabetes. Yeah. So, Kerala, in spite of being a very literate state, where you see there is uh, a poor health literacy. Yes. No matter what we say is they go for alternative treatment, easy methods. Yes. And by the time they simple. present to us, yeah, they have all the micro and macro complications. So uh, that's what I asked about the national program. <laughs> so okay. to which system they should go and then what are they telling? <laughs> yeah. And no, they are not. It is the, actually the program was started in 2010. Yeah. And it is actually it is running in uh, our system, modern system, but recently there has been changes. Ice, uh, the recent changes suggest that they can take opinion of ice in prevention of diabetes and hypertension. Okay. Recently, that's uh, after uh, one or two years, they are, uh, this ice uh, people are running diabetes and hypertension, the, this NCD prevention clinics. Okay. So, time has to prove that. Yes, and <laughs> majority of patients will end up in CKD, DKD. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? So many are asking for your slides. Yeah, definitely, ma'am. I will yeah. share with Vishnu. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a time. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. And okay. the video will be uploaded in our uh, Spice Root YouTube channel also. Okay. Hopefully this was beneficial, I think. Yeah, definitely. Sure, sir. It was such a wonderful case-based informative session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I also thank uh, Indu Madam for chairing the session. Thank and you. also a huge shout out thank, thank you to all the participants who patiently uh, stayed in spite of the initial technical glitches. And sir's presentation was worth the wait. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. And good night all. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.